go. Uh, good afternoon, all. I'd like to welcome you to this uh, I IEA uh, Energy and Climate event. Um, we're going to be listening to Jim Gannon, the CEO of the Sustainable Energy Authority of Ireland, speaking on, it was speaking, starting with the SEAI's um, emerging focus on behavioural economics and its impact on our low-carbon low transition. But I think if we take our discussions over the last hour as any indication, um, we will be having an extremely um, stimulating and wide-ranging um, uh, presentation and discussion. Um, a couple of um, uh, practical things. Uh, first, um, please switch off your phones. Um, Jim's address will be on the record, and the slides will be available after, is Certainly that right? Available, yeah. Okay, and then we'll have a Q&A session afterwards, which will follow uh, the Chatham House rule. Um, I would like just to uh, point out to you, there'll be a couple of upcoming events now in the Energy and Climate series. On the 28th of June, we're having a climate event um, by Caroline Westblom. She's from CAN Network uh, Europe, and she'll be talking about um, this, the recent report from the CAN Network on the climate performance of various countries, I believe. So uh, Ireland's climate and energy policy within a European context, a critical perspective. And then on the 16th of July, we will have um, a, 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 the second lecture in the 2018 ESB IIEA lecture series. This is sponsored by the ESB, and that will be by uh, Professor Jean-Michel Glachon from the Florence School of uh, Regulation, again on clean energy for all Europeans, challenges and opportunities. And knowing Professor Glachon, that will also be a wide-ranging and stimulating event with a lot of experience behind it. Um, anyway, uh, I think that for most people here, um, Jim needs very little introduction. Uh, he has been chief executive of the SEAI since uh, May 2016. Um, his career uh, was, most recently, he was director at RPS Group, leading the energy, environment, and health and safety um, area. So he has focused on energy throughout much of his career encompassing policy, infrastructure, technology, European, national, regional levels, and a strong background in engineering, environmental assessment, and business. Please. Thank Jim. you very much. Uh, thanks, everyone, for attending. And I hope we have a short presentation followed by a value-adding dialogue. And I think that's what's most important here. Sometimes, as a civil engineer, you feel like a charlatan talking about behavioral economics and behavioral sciences. but what I'm going to articulate really is the need we have for looking at different types of policy intervention. SEAI's experience over the past number of years and our desire to increase social awareness, social acceptance perhaps, and then also in terms of specific decisions and interventions, increasing the application of behavioral economics and related sciences to the policy making process. Um, I won't dwell on SEAI. I believe most of you will know who we are. If not, please visit our website. Uh, I'm going to briefly introduce where we are today with regard to our energy targets. Mention CO2. Uh, I'll speak to 2020 projections and also our 2030 challenges now that they are becoming clearer. And in that, I will speak to the cultural relationship we have or do not have with infrastructure generally in Ireland. I'll move then on to behavioural economics, how SEAI saw a need to educate ourselves better on that and to provide advice to our policymakers on that topic, and then a couple of final closing thoughts. So in terms of renewable energy in Ireland in 2017, and these are provisional figures, uh, we had a relatively successful year. Uh, it was a good wind year in terms of capacity installation. With regard to transport, we had an increase in the level of substitution of fuels. And with regard to heat, there was a small level of decarbonisation, but a lot of that might have been related to oil price and people's behaviour. And again, oil price and people's behaviour is an important anchor point to have. In terms of CO2, briefly, decoupling can happen. Um, I, have, I have a sense sometimes that there's a risk that Ireland will talk ourselves into failure. Um, at the project... Project 2040 launch, launch, apologies, last week, 
Uh, one of the contributors said that Martin Luther King didn't start his speech by saying, I have a nightmare, and try to drive people towards change. He started by saying, I have a dream, and started leading people towards change with positive motivation, positive impact, positive interventions. So we have some good news stories in Ireland. In 2013 and 2014, despite strong economic growth, we reduced the CO2 intensity of our emissions from energy. In the next year, 2014 to 2015, and 2015 to 2016, our emissions increased, but not at the same rate of economic increase. And last year, despite 4% modified domestic demand growth, which extracts aircraft leasing and IP transfers, again, our energy-related CO2 reduced by 2% or a little bit above. Our CO2 intensity in electricity reduced by over 9% in last year. So policy and private sector activity in tandem can have a material impact and does have a material impact. But a lot more to do. So in terms of our 2020 scenarios, uh, last year SEAI would have seen us landing somewhere around 13.2% against a target of 16% overarching. Uh, this year we produced a number of analyses. And that's due to the fact that our initial calculations would have started in October of last year for our projections this year, prior to the announcement of the Capital Development Plan, which will see some impact on the ground prior to 2020, and also prior to a distinct change in oil price and the signal that that sends to consumers of oil, whether it be in your car or in Ireland in particular, in your domestic heating. And these will have an influence. The net impact is that we still see ourselves reaching somewhere between 13 and 14 percent, depending on some policy interventions that are made. In terms of 2030, um, you can take a number of different views. I think important to me is that Europe agreed a 32 percent level of renewables in energy about a week and a half ago. What that means for Ireland, if you look at the 20% European target versus the 16% target we arrived at for 2020, it could see Ireland with an ask of about 26 or 27% of renewables by 2030. If that's the scale of ask, then we need significant activity across all sectors, and the current methods we are using in a business-as-usual case likely may not reach the target. So we need new methods of decarbonisation, we need new methods of incentivizing renewable electricity in this country. That said, I think it's very important to make the point that our expectation should not be that the National Development Plan and the Exchequer funding described in that is the limit of our ambitions. One thing that is true around the world and being realized by many, not just as a challenge but as a business opportunity, is that private sector finance, and Laura and our organization Sustainable Nation Ireland would speak to that quite well, is required and at scale. And we're now working, I'm, I'm going to the Banking Federation of Ireland after this meeting. We are speaking to the EIB, private sector finance providers as well, on how we engage that finance. What is the regulatory planning, licensing and consenting framework that needs to be in place to attract private sector investment to decarbonisation? And that's with regards to large scale infrastructure, but also importantly, with regard to smaller scale interventions. How do we efficiently aggregate small-scale intervention, interventions like domestic retrofit or SME energy efficiency, where the amount of finance in each packet required is quite small, but if we can bring them together, it becomes attractive to institutional investors. In terms of global clean energy investment, again, I, I suppose the prevailing wind is quite positive towards it. Lots of sustainable energy technologies are now mainstream. The value proposition around energy efficiency in large industry certainly is well recognised. In certain segments, even here in Ireland, lighting is seen to be an area where activity can increase and lots of new business models have come into Ireland in the past year and a half that provide people an ability to execute an energy efficiency project where they don't necessarily have the means to finance it themselves. I do think that there is a very obvious increased interest in international banks, structural funds and private sector funds over the last two years, both in terms of infrastructure and in terms of on-the-ground investment in aggregated project types. 
So to my mind, a positive out of this is that clean energy and energy efficiency isn't just an environmental fad anymore. It's just a good use of capital in many cases. It is a good investment to make. It's a matter of looking to see where market failures are between good uses of capital in specific projects and the finance that may become available to those projects. And again, this is the type of activity that ourselves and also Sustainable Nation Ireland are heavily involved in at the moment. I'm going to focus on renewable electricity for a minute to, to bring it down to a point around social acceptance and awareness. Um, the cost curves for renewable electricity technologies are coming down quite quickly. Um, and there is a, there's an opportunity there for Ireland to capitalise on this, taking the learnings from other jurisdictions as they deployed themselves renewable electricity. Um, we are the Sustainable Energy Authority of Ireland, not the Renewable Energy Authority of Ireland. And I think it's an important point to make in that our modelling exercises see Ireland using gas in particular for a number of years yet to come. It will take us a long time to decarbonise fully. Many of the international modelling exercises also see a requirement to use natural gas on a long-term pathway to decarbonising as it balances some of the intermittent generation we see coming down the line. Um, some of the challenges here for renewable electricity generation are obvious and they're spoken about quite a bit around planning and consenting, market regulation and policy consistency and certainty. Also, I think something that we don't speak to often is the scale of market in Ireland. Ireland, for a lot of the major international developers, is small scale. And the type of individual project you see in Ireland due to our spatial, uh, our spatial development pattern are smaller scale projects. So that large scale project where you can deploy lower cost finance, it's harder to find in Ireland. I think even if you imagine that you resolve some of these challenges and constraints, you are faced with that social challenge, that social acceptance challenge. And at the core of this is where we we have a gap between society and its valuing of infrastructure. And I believe that this is across transport infrastructure, water infrastructure, energy infrastructure, you name it. For most people, they don't engage or consciously think about infrastructure unless something goes wrong with it and there is a fault, or unless new infrastructure is required and it's perceived as an imposition. That day-to-day -day salience or value of infrastructure and the value it provides you is at the core of a lot of our challenges. And I think it's quite important because um, people in a room like this can influence political will, but political will is derived from voters and people on the ground. And one of our activities more recently, the Sustainable Energy Communities Network, provides mentors and support to communities whereby they develop their own master plan for their community to decarbonize. And we are finding, certainly at a qualitative level, we're going to perform quantitative analysis on it in parallel, uh, that attitudes are shifting, in that those people involved in determining their own transition to a low-carbon economy become more aware of the fact that we need some of this infrastructure. There will be challenging projects in certain locations, but they become aware that we may need pylons. We may need wind turbines. But this has to go somewhere at some point in time. And I think creating that link, creating that salience, will become far more important as we increase our ambitions. And the ask of Ireland is increased over the next number of years. So what do people in Ireland think? Um, at a high level, it's relatively positive. This is a Eurobarometer survey, not a survey by anyone in Ireland or an NGO necessarily. So this asked a representative sample size, what do you think about climate? 68% said climate was a very serious problem. Interestingly, an additional 25% said that it was a fairly serious problem. Fairly serious being a particularly Irish expression, but it's on their radar nonetheless. 34% uh, said that business and industry play a key role, just behind the role they felt that the government and policymakers play. And then finally, that fighting climate change can boost the economy. This is very important for businesses because as a business, you supply a product or a service to a consumer. And consumers are led by what is on the forecourt, what is in the shop, and by their professional advisors. And separately, you employ these people. And the influence you have on these people and the type of person you want to attract can be heavily influenced by the signal you give. Um, I think with this underlying belief and this underlying importance in people's minds, 
we've started asking ourselves the question, well, how, how does that impact us in SEAI in our day-to-day -day delivery of our activities? If this is underpinning people's beliefs, how do we get them to interact more with our Better Energy Homes scheme? How do we increase electric vehicle uptake? How do we get them to look at their oil boiler and consider alternatives, whether it be a less carbon-intensive fossil fuel or a transition to uh, heat pump or other electric alternatives? I think something around this is quite important as well in that the Irish society and society generally is more interactive, is taking more control. And there's an appetite here for change. I think that's being matched by technology cost, where you see the cost of photovoltaic panels coming down, the cost of technologies coming down that will allow a consumer to interact more with the system. And interestingly, this technology price curve is matching policy direction from Europe, where Europe has started stating things like in the clean energy package that they would like to see people with a right to generate in their home, a right to export, and a right to a market price. Now, it's left to determine whether or not that falls down into local legislation, local SIs, but that is the general direction of travel. And to my mind, there's an interesting point of divergence here where you'll have some people who want to be very engaged. They want to have an app where they respond to a price signal from a market and they tell their dishwasher or their fridge or something else to switch on and switch off. But the likelihood is that we will again be a consumer-led market. And someone could come along and say, we already give you your telephony, your broadband, your television channels. We will add the energy service to your bill, and we'll, we'll deal with the rest. We'll deal with the controls. We'll deal with that headache. Don't worry about it. You can trust us. And that's where trust becomes very important, in that if we're accepting these technologies and this level of sophisticated control into our homes, and we're giving that to someone else to control it in our home, you need to trust and want the service that they will provide. And this will be a challenge we face, particularly as we start rolling out smart meters over the next number of years. What, what is the value proposition for the human in their home as we look to place smart meters into that infrastructure? So in terms of behavioral change, activities that SEAI is engaged in that led us to this, this font of wisdom would have been just trying to influence people and businesses. So to reduce energy use, to install sustainable energy generation where it's cost effective, where it's sustainable, to purchase energy efficient products, appliances, looking at the energy labeling schemes and our market surveillance authority role, installing energy efficiency upgrades. So this is the building envelope, the heavier, the heavier pieces of kit. And then again, creating that link and understanding the value of sustainable energy in your home, in your business, in society on a day-to-day -day basis. So our activity to date runs across some of these programs. I mentioned an example earlier where for our fuel poverty directed scheme, uh, we used to issue a letter that said, uh, would you like a free energy upgrade to your home? Where now we sent a letter that says, would you like a free energy upgrade to your home that is worth? And we insert the number. And there's now a value suddenly to that energy upgrade to the home. Uh, similarly, across a couple of other programs, we're using smaller interventions at different points along their decision-making process to tie them to it. So someone who applies for an initial building energy rating, or not building energy rating, better energy homes, grant to upgrade their home, there is a dropout rate between that person who applies and the person who actually delivers down the line. So we're trying to see how do we widen that sales pipeline for someone who becomes interested and signs up to a grant at the start making sure that we get a higher percentage of execution and delivery down the bottom end. Now, what's key to us around this consumer choice is making it easy for people. So how do we increase awareness? How do we make it understandable and just easier to execute? Separately, how do we engage them at the right time? So we are aware from our research that once every seven years, people will generally decide to invest in their home. It could be a small investment, it could be a heavy investment, but you have that one time in seven years to really engage with them and bring them towards deeper retrofit, bring them towards a more decarbonized position. How do you know when that's coming up? How do you position yourself to make that timely, I suppose? Finally, you need to make it attractive. They need to want to do it. Is it through a financial incentive? Is it through showing them that other people in their housing estate have already done it, and that for that housing estate, where your home is exactly like your neighbor's home, you should be able to do this and cost effectively. And finally, how do you make it social, which speaks to this second piece? How do you let them know that other people just like them are doing it, that this is what people are doing now, and bring them down that road, and bring that down, down that road of peer awareness and not necessarily peer pressure? 
And this speaks to one of the frameworks that underpins behavioral economics, which is the EAST framework, how you make things easy, attractive, social, and timely. And SEAI had started looking at some of these aspects, although not by design, up to a couple of years ago. Um, a year and a half ago, we determined that we wanted to get more involved in behavioral economics as a science, and also determining how we could bring that value to our policy design role. So for our department, for other departments, notably housing planning and local government, we assist in the policy optioneering space. Where a demand for policy is outlined, whether through a European directive or from the political class and from the department, we engage in that data and analysis piece and framework design piece that underpins the ultimate decision that is made in the department. What became more important to us is that where these interventions approach a homeowner or a consumer or a small business in particular, behavioral sciences had a lot to add. The analysis and the empirical evidence that can be brought from behavioral tests can inform that policy decision-making piece. And again, at a very simplistic level, we started looking at economics. Should we continue on the path of grants to the mass market, or should we start looking at different methods of incentivization? In certain cases, should it be looking at low-cost finance? Should it be a tax rebate? In certain cases, maybe an economic incentive isn't required at all. It's a different method of incentivization. In terms of psychology, how could we increase the salience of comfort and benefits in the home? How do we reduce hassle factors? How do we increase trust in the advice we give? And also framing. How do we provide that framework within someone's mind that leads them to the right decision? And then finally, making it social. How do we use the activity of neighbours, the activity of people just like you, to encourage you to bring it on that pathway of making the right decision? I won't go into a list of behavioural interventions. I suppose what, what happened was that we started reading papers about behavioural science and behavioural economics and realised that there was an awful lot more under the, under the bonnet than we realised. As a result, we put together a behavioural economics team that examines economics, psychology and sociology. I think what's important is that there are a wide range of potential interventions and varied impacts from all of them. I think what's important from our perspective is keeping an open mind. Similar to the technologies we will have to use to decarbonise Ireland over the next number of years, there is no single solution. There is no single intervention. In certain cases, we might not know the specific pieces of an intervention that really had an impact. The plastic bag levy was cited earlier, and it can be hard to disentangle whether that was a social framework and people felt almost pressurised because people weren't using plastic bags anymore, or was it the personal decision where the five cent whether it was the actual cost or the principle of paying five cent was the motivating factor. In either case, it worked, although cause and effect might be harder to link. I think we also need to recognise fairly clearly that there are differences in local economic and social conditions. And as we conducted our review that we're publishing next month, this became more and more apparent. Just because a behavioural economic intervention worked in a particular jurisdiction, doesn't mean it will necessarily work here in Ireland where we could have different social, economic or other underpinning, um, I suppose, environmental conditions. Uh, briefly, an insight into our review. Uh, we reviewed nearly 2,500 papers. We took that down to an abstract level and determined which could be of most value to our review. We brought that down to 175 papers then, which we looked at in detail. And these were papers which described empirical tests that we felt were delivered in a robust way of behavioural economic interventions. It was not lab-scale testing. It was in the field testing in each case of interventions that may or may not have worked. In terms of reporting... Apologies. In terms of reporting outcomes, we'll publish in July. It will be very open in terms of its publication. We'll be inviting people to engage with us to ask questions on the case studies that we're looking at. And also, at the end of the report, we do come forward with recommendations. The range of different interventions that are there that you could look at is staggering. And it will be important that we prioritise and we approach it in a timely way. And that there are some interventions where we feel you could have an impact in a short space of time. So let's go ahead and try those now. 
In other cases, we'll work with either policy delivery, uh, policy delivery, or we'll work with private sector entities such as energy supply companies, and are working with some indeed right now to see what can we build in over a longer period of time. Um, some of the reporting outcomes was that, were that there's too much emphasis being placed on the residential sector. There's very little being placed on the commercial sector. And although industry makes decisions in a different framework, small medium enterprise does have a decision-making paradigm that is similar to the residential sector. So we think there are more learnings and more tests that can be put in place there. Uh, there is a very small focus on what works for encouraging energy efficient measures as distinct from other behavioural measures. So uh, behavioural change in terms of someone leaving a room and switching on or off a light at the right time or changing the setting on their thermostat, quite a bit of focus on that. Less focus on what incentivizes someone to purchase something that is more energy efficient or make that installation choice where they will pay a premium for upgrading their building, their business. <coughs> their home. And there was a very low focus on the actual energy saving associated with the programs. So for SEAI, we are focused on the outcome, the real impact of this intervention. So to our mind, and I'll cite a couple of examples later, what we want to know is that for years one, three, and five, that the intervention made had an impact that stuck. And again, reflecting back on this piece, a, a, trying to get someone to change their behavior in terms of switching on and off lights, there can be quite a bit of rebound there. Whereas if you convince someone to make a purchasing decision that changes their decision from applying a B-rated appliance to an A-rated appliance, that appliance will be in place performing that function over a period of time. If you can change their behavior where they want to upgrade their home to include aspects of energy efficiency or decarbonization in particular, that upgrade will last and will stand the test of time. So again, for us, we really want to focus on impact. How do you lead people to decisions that have a lasting impact, as opposed to a short-term change of their, of their mentality. Um, one interesting area for us that, that highlighted something more general was um, we don't need to necessarily develop new routes to market in each of these cases. So in some cases, we need to look at how we communicate more efficient driving or improving your car's performance from an energy efficiency and safety perspective by going with a better tire to people. So instead of trying to develop a new route and broad brush advertising, let's look at the NCT, where many people sit every year worried about the performance of their car. Can we engage them at that point in time? Everyone gets a tax certificate, and mostly people get an insurance certificate every year. Can we use that point of contact, that point of concern, to deliver a message there? I've already mentioned the warmer homes, the warmer homes proposition around value. Um, one other case is with the generic energy bill that people receive, some electronically, some on hard copy. And there are cases internationally where you can bring a lot more value to the customer through the energy bill. One example is where they started showing people how they performed against homes that were just like theirs. And there has been an impact and a lasting impact from that sort of communication. And this is something where we can interact with energy supply companies on this front and in quite a short period of time. Two other specific examples. One was O-Power on Honeywell, where people were, giving, were given a more sophisticated control over their energy use in the States. And also they were given one of these home energy reports that was intended to engage them in that peer effect. How am I doing against my peers, against homes that are more like my own? It was suggestive of savings of between two and 5%. A separate one in Germany was on defaulting. And defaulting is analogous to some other examples, such as pensions. If you are defaulted into a pension, and that is your starting point, some may choose to come out of a pension. If you are defaulted into being a donor of organs, more people will stay with that default position than will choose not to be. Whereas if the default is the non-participating, most people will stick with that. So in Germany, they defaulted 150,000 electricity consumers to a green tariff. These consumers were told that the green tariff was more expensive than the alternative tariff, which would have been conventional energy, yet over 90% of people stayed with that green tariff. Our challenge to this study was the after two months piece. 
where to my mind, it comes back to this frequency of decision making. And within that two month period, how many were likely to change their energy supplier in that period in any case? So my interest is in, if they were defaulted to that, how long did that stick for? Is it one, is it two, is it three years down the line? But nevertheless, it shows the power of defaulting. And that is one of the areas we feel that early activity could benefit us. In terms of what next, in SEAI, we have an upgraded BER advisory report coming out. So the building energy rating in Ireland was of its time. It required an update in terms of the sophistication of assessment and also the sophistication of how we communicate that to the homeowner. And we have intentionally involved our behavioural economics unit in the design of that report using precedent in other jurisdictions. So when you get a building energy report that previously wouldn't have gone into specific detail about your home as much as it might, the new report, which will come out in August, will go into very specific detail about how your type of home, with the condition it's in, can be upgraded along a certain pathway. And again, we've used different, different types of signaling here. Up the top is loss aversion. Instead of saying, if you invest this much, you can save this much, it's saying you are currently losing this amount of money per annum for not having made a certain decision. We're also using benchmarking against houses of a similar type. And we're also using uh, an approach around meaningful benefits, trying to, try, trying to make it tangible to people what their, how their home could benefit and how they could benefit in their lives. Um, I think another aspect that's important in this is tying the behavioural economics piece to that value in the consumer's mind. Uh, it is something that we are looking at and will continue looking at in SEAI, whether we would continue providing grants for measures. So you provide a grant for insulation. You provide a grant for heating controls. We need to have a more informed and a more engaged consumer if we want to move to a paradigm where we're saying, your house is at D2. If you move it to C1 or B2 or A2, this is the amount of grant funding that is available. So you're funding performance as opposed to funding specific measures. This sort of gap could, could well, this sort of gap around awareness and understanding could help to be filled by the communications aspects, I suppose, and, and targeting of, um, of behavioural economics. Finally, and apologies for the ramble, although focused on individual decisions, and we do expect to take a pragmatic approach on this, there might be percentage changes here or there. You have exceptional cases like the plastic bag levy where there was a huge return and a huge response to the incentive that was put in place. But our expectation is a rational one where we expect small incremental change in the decisions of homeowners over a period of time. So 2%, 5%, 10% here. In SMEs, a 2% change, a 5% change, a 10% change here. We don't expect that this will solve the problem in and of itself. It is just another value-adding lens through which policy should be, should be viewed, particularly in the development stages. Separately, the report that we're producing should be considered just a starting point. It will be very important after the publication of the report that we prioritise, that we work with people in the public sector and the private sector to say which interventions should we look at first, where will value be derived, and how do we communicate that to consumers, to business owners, and to those who will be involved in the development of the intervention. And finally, we do have a true belief that informing and empowering and motivating the individual can have an influence not just on their smaller scale decisions, but also on how they perceive large scale infrastructure projects and technology adoption. And I think we're about to see analogues of social acceptance to large scale infrastructure around some of the smaller scale but high aggregation infrastructures that are coming into place. The first, by, by illustration, will be around smart meters. It is not a single piece of infrastructure, a single pylon, a single substation, a single wind farm. It is a large scale aggregation of small interventions where societal thought will coalesce around it. How do we make people value that infrastructure, accept it, want to interact with it? And similarly around electric vehicles or around electrification or other uses, or, or other, I suppose, options for heating. Um, so again, I think linking the small to the large is quite important. We've seen evidence of it in our sustainable energy communities network, and we'll continue to drive things in that direction. Um, 
that's the end of the formal presentation piece. Again, sorry for the, uh, the slightly inchoate nature, but it is a topic that's new, new to us. Thank you.